It is uh, great to be back with you. Thank you for uh, the Sunday off last week. I, we had a, a great time uh, with the wedding. Um, many of you uh, not only were participants as in attending, but also there's so many of you that helped out, and we really, as a family, uh, appreciate that too. Um, I really did have such a good time. Um, you know, uh, Cassidy had asked me if I was interested in in doing the ceremony, and I told her if she couldn't find anybody else, I was willing to do it. Um, but, it, you know, it, it wasn't, at least for me, it wasn't something where it's like, man, I, I can't wait to marry my daughter off as in the actual um, leading that part of it because it seems like for so many years I've stood here and uh, I've always wondered what it's like to sit in those chairs right because I I get to be on this side and watch all that happen and I love just sitting there and uh, and watching it happen from uh, there in the front row so uh, I had a great time and uh, hopefully someday uh, hopefully someday not too soon uh, I'll sit on this side of the sanctuary as well right Carson <laughs> oh yeah I, no uh, we have nothing to announce at least that I'm aware of so you're welcome uh, and thanks Brianna great job uh, leading bring it on that that is uh, her mantra uh, so that that's really true even in the fact of leading the uh, this time this morning uh, getting up in front of people that isn't always what people are looking forward to is how can I get up in front more often uh, but you did a great job with that and there were just in the big picture there are 58 kids connected to uh, our church that went to camp uh, this past summer that's from senior high to uh, the kids camp Brianna was was there with them throughout uh, I, I did that one time. Uh, that was my first year as a youth pastor here. I went to all the camps. I had a great time, but as I've never done it again. Uh, it's just, it's exhausting. And so thank you so much for doing that. We don't have uh, a youth pastor right now. And so uh, people step up and do different things at different times to help out. So uh, big help with that. The other piece I wanted to let you know of is... Uh, not only were there 58 kids that went, but also uh, within our budget, we have about $1,500 that we gave in scholarships, plus another $1,100 on top of that. So uh, through the church, about $2,600 was given to help those uh, 58 kids uh, go to camp. And, and again, I think that is money very well spent. We will continue to, it's my goal that any kid that wants to go to camp should be able to go. And if that means we pay the whole way, we do that. Or if that means we help out with 20 bucks, uh, we do that. So uh, uh, camp is an amazing uh, place where uh, spiritual battles go on for the hearts of our kids. And, and that was true again uh, this summer. And so uh, continue to pray for the impact that those camps and that week have on kids. You know that if you went to camp, part of who you are spiritually uh, today is because of those camps back then, and so uh, that's that's part of our goal. Well, again, this morning we are looking at parables, and uh, the parable this morning you you've probably heard of. In fact, many people within our culture talk about or know about Good Samaritans. You read about it in the paper, how Good Samaritans stop and help someone. Good Samaritans are plugging in over here. We use the term in our culture. Not everyone knows specifically where it comes from, or perhaps even as we look this morning, hopefully there will be things that, that God speaks to each one of us about. And so as we begin, I'm just going to invite you once again to bow your heads and in the quietness of this morning, ask the Spirit to speak to you, to, to talk to where you're at, the needs perhaps that you have, the joys, the sorrows, give them all to Him. And ask him to speak to you this morning. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it's not often that we have 
quiet moments like this in our life. Lord, I know that in the, in the stillness, in those quiet times, it becomes even easier to hear, to hear your voice. Lord, I, I pray this morning that, that not only would you um, quiet our hearts and our minds, but, but speak to our souls. And we've come here this morning to, to give you honor and glory, to, to worship you. I pray, Lord, that, that we would hear from you. May we be encouragement to others. May we walk through life together. Thank you for the love that you've shown to us, that you have not left us alone, but not only have you given us your son who, who gave his life for us, but through that life, death, and resurrection, Lord, you're with us each and every day. Your spirit lives within us as we follow you as disciples. Uh, we praise your name. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So I invite you to take your Bibles. We are in Luke chapter 10, and there is a Bible there in your row. If you happen to use that Bible this morning, we are on page 843. In parables, we get to see stories that run in parallel. Remember, parallel and parable come from that same Greek root word. Stories that run parallel with the message that Christ came to give. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. And in the uh, last month or so, as you have been coming to church, and uh, as you have looked at the outline, you've probably noticed that I haven't really worked that hard. Uh, you, if you've used the outline, you'll usually notice that I have the same one in the same order each and every week, dealing with uh, the parable, the context, and the meaning. However, typically, we start by looking at the context. However, this morning, just to throw you a little curve, I decided to start with the parable instead. So, if you have your Bibles, look with me at Luke chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 30 through 36, and uh, see this parable that Jesus gave uh, to, the, to the people, to his disciples, and specifically to the expert in the law that we will go back and, and see asked a question. So in Luke 10, starting in verse 30, it says, In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be, do be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him the Samaritan said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you have. The location of this parable that took place was on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. As people would travel in that day and age, this wasn't just made up. Remember, these are real-life stories, stories that could have happened. But Jesus says that in this story that he made up, that there was an attack by robbers. That happened frequently. It was common. The listeners would have known that it was dangerous to travel by themselves between Jerusalem and Jericho and that this could actually take place. As the man who was attacked, robbed, and, and beaten lay there, it says that three individuals walked by. The first two were religious leaders, a priest and a Levite. Notice that it says there that for both of those individuals, they noticed the man. It wasn't like the man was laying there and they walked by without seeing him there. It says that they saw him. They saw him and that they not only chose to walk by, but walked on the other side of the road. Likely they had excuses to not get involved. 
There are times in our life when non-involvement seems like a wise choice. Have you ever faced those in your lives? Perhaps it's as simple as driving down the interstate. You see a car on the side of the road. You're traveling probably right at the speed limit, 75, right? And yet still slowing down to stop and help. Well, it's difficult, isn't it? There's there's places to get to. There's a reason why you're on that interstate traveling at those speeds. You have somewhere to go. And there's someone behind you, correct? There's other people coming down the road. They're sure to stop and help that person that, that's there on the side of the road. Not involvement there's a technical term for that, and it's called the bystander effect. In fact, the more people that are around and see an event take place where someone's in need, the greater chance there is that no one will do anything. Isn't that amazing? The more people that see a need, the less likely it is that they will get involved. I have to think of an experience that happened in my own life in the life of our family we were living in South Dakota our kids were in the uh, I believe around in the second first grade somewhere Cassidy was about first grader which means Carson would have been three or four years old and and Cassidy loves animals she loves animals and there was this dog in the neighborhood that was running around it was it was a stray I think it may or may not I think it had a collar on it we weren't but we didn't know whose it was, and, and Cassidy went, and, and she was concerned not only for that dog that it might get run over, or, but that it was lost, and that, that there was somebody out there that, that needed that dog, and needed to have that dog back in their home. So she went, and she got that dog, and uh, they were going to call the, the pound and, and, you know, and let them know that this dog was here and everything was all right. And so they, they took the dog inside, and within moments after walking through the door, uh, the dog jumped. It was so excited, it jumped up and nipped Cassidy on the nose, and it got Carson, I believe, on the, on the forehead. It bit him up on the forehead. And um, about that time, I got a phone call. Um, and uh, you remember that, Sal? Yeah, she wasn't too happy. Um, the kids were they were headed to the to the um, uh, to the emergency room. Did this dog have rabies? Um, what was the deal? All of it worked out just fine. Uh, however, later on, as as Sally and I were talking about that, um, the question came up, or the discussion that took place is, why is it when you try to help, sometimes you end up getting hurt? I think the phrase sometimes that we use is, why is it that no good deed goes unpunished? Uh, sometimes when we get involved, when we see the needs, and, and, and we don't pass by and we get involved, there are repercussions in our own lives. There's hurt that takes place. And so I, I think, at least for myself, there's also in the back of my mind, not only well, they'll get it, right? There's all these other people around. They see the need. Surely one of them will take care of it. Also, we have these ideas, real ideas, that sometimes as we try to help, there's things that happen to us as well. You hear of the Good Samaritans, correct, that, that stop to help somebody on the side of the road and proceed to get hit by a car as, as they're trying to help uh, in those places. Involvement can be risky, and the first two religious leaders, the priest and the Levite, they saw the need and they passed on. The third individual that Jesus talks about was a Samaritan. The Samaritan was an undesirable. He was a half Jew. There were Jews, then there were Gentiles, the barbarians that lived around them, and then there were the Samaritans. The Samaritans were those that, when the Jews had been taken off into captivity, there were some that were left behind. And those that were left behind intermarried with those that had captive, that had taken them captive. And so when, so when the Jews came back to their land, there was this intermarriage between the enemy and the Jews. And so those that were the pure Jews, they didn't include them whether it be in the general festivals and the activities that they had going on, but even more specifically in what they believed. And so they forced them to, to worship somewhere else. Hard to believe that we would excuse or push people away because of race and religion, right? That's sarcasm, by the way. Uh, 
But it still goes on today, doesn't it? Those are still the same things that as we read through our papers, right? Race and religion. It's very easy to separate ourselves or to say, maybe non-verbally, we're better than them because of race and religion. And that's exactly what Jesus spoke to as he talked about the Samaritan. It says that the Samaritan had pity on him. That word means compassion. And Jesus says that the Samaritan cared physically and financially for this, for this Jewish man. He got involved. He got involved. Well, that's the parable that Jesus gave. So what's the context that we find this parable in? Well, first of all, if you go back to the beginning of chapter 10, actually the first 24 verses are, are separated from our, our actual passage. But I, I think it's relevant to, to notice what took place in those first 24 verses. In verse 1, it says that Jesus sent out 72. There were 72 individuals that were following after Jesus. This isn't the 12. It might have included the 12, but 72 individuals were sent out. He gave them instructions of what to do as they went. They were called to minister, to go out and to minister to others. And if they were rejected, they were given instructions. And if they were accepted, they were given instructions. But they were told to love people, to meet not only their physical needs, but also the spiritual needs as well. It says in verse 17 that these 72 then came back, and they had amazing stories to tell. It says that they had joy in their hearts. And in verses uh, 21, 22, 23, 24, it we get a picture of this as Jesus prays to his heavenly Father and just thanks him for the victories. Thanks him with joy in his heart of, of what he has seen taking place. That's the first part of chapter 10. Then we come to verses 25 to 28 that lead up to the parable of the Good Samaritan. It says this. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied. How do you read it? The man answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But the man, the expert in the law, wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? The expert in the law comes to Jesus, and it says that this expert wanted to put Jesus to the test. Now, when we think of that word test right away, we go to he was, he was struggling to, to try to make Jesus look bad. That might have been the case, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. That word also can mean that he sincerely wanted to know more about who this man was. An expert in the law would have known what God's word said, what the Old Testament said, and here was a man claiming to be the Messiah. So he truly could have genuinely wanted to know, is this the Messiah? He was putting him to the test to see if who he said he was was really true. And so he gave him the question in verse 25, and the questions that we'll be looking at this morning, the first one is, how do I get eternal life? That's kingdom talk. Again, that goes back to why Jesus was giving those parables, right? Kingdom talk, talking about how is it that we are to repent for the kingdom is at hand. This man wanted to know what's next. Even now, this morning, you've been thinking about what's next, right? You have plans of where you plan to go for lunch, what you will be doing this afternoon, maybe even this evening or tomorrow. I know that you're thinking about what's next because we all do it. In the short run or the long run, we are thinking about what's coming after this. What's the next event that I'm to be a part of? This man was also asking, though, does what I do, is who I am, really matter? Or can I do whatever I want to do? Have you ever thought that? What if what I believe really doesn't matter and I could really do whatever I would like, do as I please? Or, as this man is asking, is there something that I can do in this life, is there something that I can do in this life that affects eternal life? 
We don't stop and ask those questions often enough, I believe. Funerals are good times. Not good times because someone's passed away, but because they force us to again consider that I'm not going to live forever. That perhaps today is my last day. And does it matter how I live? Does it matter? Or can I do what I want? Jesus, in turn, faces this question. How do I get eternal life? And he asks the question back. He asks the question back. And what he asked was, what does the law say? Here was Jesus speaking to an expert in the law, and he meets him where he was at and asks him a question. That premise that the expert in the law had was he wanted to learn more about who Jesus was. But it's important to remind you that as you desire to find out more about who Jesus is, whether it's Jesus speaking to you, his word, or his spirit, when we deal with Jesus, we're also forced to look at who we are. We're also forced to look at who we are, and that can be difficult. I know that as I'm forced to look at who I am, what I believe, it can also make me push away church, push away people that hold me accountable. Because it's difficult sometimes to look at me and to, and to see who I am. But when we deal with who Jesus is, when we look at his word and we allow his spirit to guide us, not only will we learn more about him, but you're also going to learn more about who you are. And that's what happened with the expert in the law. The expert in the law gave an expert answer in verse 27. He gave an expert answer. He quoted what Jesus said. Do you remember what Jesus said in, in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39? Jesus was asked, what's the most important rule in all of the law? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command, and the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The expert in the law quoted Jesus, and he also quoted the law. They read this for you earlier in our, our time of singing. Out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, it says, and this was Moses speaking, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. An expert giving an expert answer. And Jesus replies to him and says, Do it and live. If you want eternal life, do it and live. You know that that's still true today? If you perfectly love Jesus and love others, you can have eternal life. You just have to do it perfectly. That's never changed. Sometimes we think, well, that's not true anymore. No, that's, that's true today. The reality, though, as we know, is we can't do it. And the expert, knowing that that is the case, either in trying to deflect that or find a way to say, I'm doing that, ask the next question. And that question is, well, then who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Have you asked that question recently? You know, even when I was a kid, programs that I watched were asking and answering that question. Sesame Street, I know it's not owned anymore by PBS, it's owned by HBO, which, so I'm not totally in, embracing Sesame Street, but... Sesame Street asked that question, who's my neighbor? And, and in fact, uh, here's a little clip. It's from the 70s, kids. This is from 1977. So some of you have never seen this. So I, I think it's worth the time watching it. So this is the question. How would you like to meet some of the people around your neighborhood today? Mm -hmm. Oh, who are the people in your neighborhood? In your neighborhood? In your neighborhood, say, who are the people in your neighborhood? The people that you meet each day. Well, Here I comes someone now. Hi there. Hi. Hey, you're kind of cute. Thanks. Hey, listen, uh, let me ask you. I see you've got a little white hat and some sunglasses, yeah. swimming suit, and a uh, Smart. little whistle. Yeah. You must be a lifeguard, eh? Well, I guess you'd be safe in saying that. Oh. Hey, mind if I wave to everyone? Wave? <laughs> dive right in. Okay. Oh, a lifeguard works out in the sun, watching over everyone. At the ocean, at the beach, or at the pool, I see that safety is the rule. Cause a lifeguard is a person in your neighborhood. In your neighborhood. She's in your, your neighborhood. neighborhood. A lifeguard is a person in your neighborhood. neighborhood. 
A person that you meet each day. Well, gotta go save some people. Okay. Well, here comes somebody else. Oh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. I see you have a hammer and a saw there. Uh, you must be a carpenter. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Could I ask you a couple of questions about being a carpenter? I wish you would. Are you a good carpenter? Never saw better. Uh, My wife this morning asked me to make the bed. What's wrong with that? I didn't have enough lumber. Oh, a carpenter is very good when it comes to hammers, nails, and wood. If you want to build a house, a porch, a chair, well, a carpenter can help you there. Cause a carpenter's a person in your neighborhood. In your neighborhood. He's in your neighborhood. And the lifeguard is a person in your neighborhood. They're the people that you meet when you're walking down the street. They're the people that you meet each day. Well, gotta go talk to the girls and boys. Bye. I saw that I bored her. <laughs> they had pretty poor jokes back then, too, didn't they? <laughs> but our neighborhood isn't just those people that live around us, right? Sesame Street taught us that it's the people that we meet as we're walking down the street, right? It's the people that we meet each day. And often as we think about the parable of the Good Samaritan, our focus then goes to who are those people? Isn't that what Jesus is wanting to teach us? Who are those people that I'm missing? Who are those people that are my neighbors that I'm not counting as neighbors? But is that what the parable is teaching? Let's take a look at it. Let's look at the meaning. Verse 36. Jesus, in reply to this question, who is my neighbor? And after giving that parable, says this. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had, who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Of the three, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, which acted like a neighbor? Do you see what Jesus did here as, as we think about the meaning? The question started with, how do I get eternal life? Jesus responds by saying, what does the law say? The expert in the law said, well, then who is my neighbor? And Jesus finishes this discussion by saying, not who is your neighbor, but which of the three, which of the three that was walking down the road was a neighbor to the victim? He didn't focus on the victim or who the neighbor was. He instead looked to the individual that's on the road, the Good Samaritan, the priest, the Levite. Which one of those three had an attitude in themselves that not looked to their own needs. No, who acted in a way that demonstrated love, grace, and compassion? Jesus points back to the words that that man said in verse 27 when asked, what does the law say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Who is acting this way? truly demonstrating their love for God. We encounter people and circumstances like this each and every day. And too often, we look for ways to get ourselves off the hook. There are too many needs. There are too, it would take too much time. I don't have enough money. There's too much care. And in the end, really what we're saying is, it's too risky. It's too risky. But Jesus goes from the question, how do I get eternal life? And causes us to look at ourselves and say, can you love God without loving other people? Not people in your small group. Not people in your Sunday school class. Not just people that you see here in Heston. But as we live our lives, as we encounter others, can we love God without loving people? The law still says, if you love God and you love others perfectly, you have eternal life. 
But there's hope. There's hope in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And a man by the name of Norval Goldenheis says this, He says this in his uh, uh, commentary on the book of Luke. He says, I have, and this is Jesus speaking, I have given you eternal life through grace, and this new life in you will enable you to have real love towards God and your fellow man and to carry it out in practice. So go forth and live a life of true love to God and to your fellow man through the power that I give you. You see, I don't have enough time I don't have enough money. I don't have enough strength. All of those things may or may not be true. But through the power of the Spirit, God says, trust me. Trust me to lead you to the people that I'm calling to, that you will have what you need to meet those needs. Because it's not, in the end, about us. We can't be good enough to earn God's salvation, and we can't be strong enough to meet everyone else's needs. But as we avail ourselves... And as we're willing to engage those opportunities and those people that come into our lives, Christ overflows from within us to others. And that's why we continue to talk of, when we think about what it means to be a disciple, when we we continue to think about what it means to be centered on Scripture, Holy Spirit empowered, reaching the world, intimate in worship, serving others in transparent relationships, yes, it starts within us. The Spirit lives within us, but it doesn't stay there. And the story of the Good Samaritan isn't just about who's your neighbor, but what is he calling me to be? What does it mean to have the Holy Spirit live within me? And who are those then that it overflows to as well? If you have ears, let them hear. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for not passing by us. Lord, the the strength that we needed, the hope that we needed, the healing that we needed. You took the time and gave everything so that we might know you, so that we might have healing. Thank you for the truth of the gospel that, that who we are is not found in what we do, but rather in what you did for us. Lord, I pray that as we live those things out, as we allow your spirit to guide us, that we will, with joy, uh, even as the campers talked about this morning, that that we would say, bring it on. Whatever it is, Lord, we we are prepared. We are willing. We we can't solve it ourselves. We can't fix it all. But we want to be available. Show us the things that you're calling us to. Help us to, to reach out in joy. And then praise you and give you the credit for the things that that take place. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.